If you've always wanted to fly like an eagle, now's your chance. We'll go soaring high above the mountains on a ride in a glider. Some play with two hands, others play with no hands, but all the tunes are lively at a festival for harmonicas. A unique piece of Idaho history comes to life. The Catholic Church joins Native Americans in a ceremony to remember. Have you ever looked up into the sky to watch an eagle fly and wondered, how do they do that? Well, there's a lot more to an eagle's flight than flapping wings. Eagles soar with their wings stretched out, higher and higher, it seems, without effort. Hello and welcome to Exploring Idaho. The way eagles fly has so intrigued some people stuck on the ground, they've come up with a way to do it themselves. It's called soaring, and some of the best soaring in North America is right here in Idaho, above and around Sun Valley. This is where pilots fly with no engine and little noise for hours, high above the ground where the eagles fly. Every day, jets fly into the Sun Valley Airport. They land full of passengers, most ready to relax and escape their busy lives. But high above town, above the peaks of the pioneers, a different kind of plane flies without a sound. We have awesome soaring here. That's pretty much the only word that covers it. It's kind of a combination of a, of a challenge and a satisfying activity. And then the beauty of it, half the, half the fun is just watching them. They're so graceful. Gliders fly with all the control of a power airplane, but without the noise of an engine. Up here is where these pilots say they escape a busy world. I'm really used to this view of the world, and I can't even imagine not seeing the pioneers every day. I love the mountains, and I love to go look at it from the air. It's really a great thing. Looks like a good day today. Before he can take off, Nelson Funston has some cleaning to do. Those are bugs from the last flight. Nelson has 80 feet of bugs to scrub from one wingtip to the other. Most of the time is spent working on the finish. But even when they're perfectly clean, it's hard to figure how a glider flies. Gliders are simple with a sleek design and they're lightweight, but that still doesn't explain it. The wings is what makes an airplane fly, and we have really long ones, so it flies much better. It's a tow plane that helps those wings get off the ground. A rope attaches to the glider. Well, we're going to close the lid and go. And much like the rope that pulls a water skier, this one tows the glider into flight. I can't think of too many sports that really do have the challenge that this does because it is a concentration sport. A sport played on a field with no posted boundaries. Here we are. Three. There we go. Wow. We have unbelievable lift here. People come here to soar and have for years and years. The view blows people's minds. When we get up over the hills and see the pioneers and there are these big 12,000 foot peaks sitting out there and they didn't realize they were there, they just go, wow, this is incredible. All is well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's what we like. Wow, look at 
look here. Oh, look at that. We have a lot of eagles here. We fly together a lot. And there's a lot to be learned from eagles. The birds circle in rising columns of hot air to gain altitude. The same updrafts that will lift a glider. You know, we use eagles as indicators of lift. And the eagles sometimes use us as indicators of lift. I've passed them before, where they have come where I've been, while I'm going where they were. It's pretty funny. After a while, it's time to call it a day. Here we go, down we go. And return to the real world on the ground. Until it's time to soar with the eagles again. Yeah, it's a whole different thing up there. That's all there is to it. A national record for soaring was set in Sun Valley, and it stood for years until the performance of gliders improved and someone was able to beat it. But gliding is not just for professionals. It's available for anyone to try if you're just brave enough. So later on in the show, we'll tell you how to get more information about that. But if you think the sky is the limit to adventure in Idaho, then I think this next story just might change your mind. New technology is making Idaho a premier place to visit outer space. And Exploring Idaho's John Miller is here to explain that. Well, Dee, let's talk about the last time you visited a planetarium. A while Long ago. Long time, yeah. me too. I think it might be time for a return trip because mm. technology has improved and it's being installed at a brand new state-of-the-art planetarium being built at the College of Southern Idaho near Twin Falls. Soon you'll be able to sit back and blast through the stars like never before. If this looks like something out of the 50s, that's because it is. The star ball, the old way of putting stars in planetarium skies. At the new Faulkner Planetarium, it's become an historical exhibit, and now they're opening a new eye on outer space. It's cutting edge, state of the art in uh, all regards as far as planetariums are concerned. The new version of the star ball isn't a ball at all, but a lens at the center of a 151 seat auditorium. This is impressive for uh, the uh, Magic Valley area and for all of Idaho. Uh, it is the largest planetarium in the state now and uh, the most technological. The stars are stored in a computer. Manager Rick Greenwald has the universe literally at his fingertips. He can show you the sky over the North Pole, strike one key, and you're standing on the South Pole. For now, he demonstrates with a small monitor what visitors will see as they sit back and shoot through a star field in three dimensions. Shows can uh, range in topics from uh, the solar system to galaxies to stars. But now it can be much more than outer space. We might eventually have topics of uh, medicine and uh, Oh, uh, weather, uh, all kinds of things. Greenwald says visitors may someday venture through the human body or explore the world of a single cell. So basically the possibilities are limitless. Limitless according to the uh, what you can think of in the mind. And what you can program into the computer. Have a seat in this room and the sky is no longer the limit. Indeed, the Faulkner Planetarium's advanced computer and projection system is one of only 35 in the world, so it's something for those kids to get out and see in that part of the state. So when will we be able to do that? When do they open for the should, public? Should be done by the end of November, and they expect to be having field trips through there by the beginning of next year. Boy, I'll go. Looks great. Sure. John, thank you very you much. When Exploring Idaho continues, we'll take you to a tiny town in Idaho invaded by harmonica lovers. That's amazing. I have never saw so many in my life. <laughs> Welcome back. The town of Yellow Pine is one of the smallest in our state, but once a year it attracts a huge crowd. And Exploring Idaho's Jennifer Eisenhardt is here to tell us why. Do you know only about 50 people live in Yellow Pine year round? It's so remote. There are no telephones, only a two-way radio to make calls. To get there, you drive a windy one-lane road for 60 miles through Payette National Forest. But once every year, hundreds of people make the drive to hear the sounds of a unique brand of music. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's a great setting. It's out you know, away from the city. And... Oh, the scenery is terrific. 
the clean, fresh air and the people. Still has the old western atmosphere. Yellow Pine is one of those few true western towns. The main street is just a dirt road, and the town bar is also the only cafe. None of these homes even have telephones. It is a sleepy little town. So sleepy that most times of year, Yellow Pine is home to more dogs than people. So it's kind of strange that one weekend out of every year, hundreds of people invade this tiny town. It gets, it gets bigger every year. I, I can't believe how, how much it's grown. Oh, I love it. I love it. But there's more to love than just the scenery. It's a lot of fun, you know. It's like going to a fiddle contest, except most everybody's playing harmonica here. Everybody has a different style. Everybody has a different look. From Danny Wilson's big bass, <laughs> to Eugene Bourne's Little Lady, 50 harmonica players perform on one stage in one weekend. I have never saw so many in my life. <laughs> it's enough to perk the ears of the most casual observer. That's amazing. We've sat every night to watch it, and I think my hands have been the highest. <laughs> they come from across the country, ready to jam at a moment's notice. How quick are you on the draw? Slow. <laughs> People call Ray Cole the gunslinger in the key of C, but Ray plays in almost any key. Eugene keeps his little lady on a tight leash. 24 pound test fishing line. I don't know, but that keeps me from swallowing and getting into a lot of trouble. Well, whether they play with two hands or no hands, or five toes to the beat. It's all good, I like it all. And it's the liveliest weekend all year round for a sleepy little town like Yellow Pine. Oh, what classic characters in that story, mm. Jen. Thank you. I've always wondered, though, how long does it take to learn to play the harmonica? Well, the people there, most of them have been playing 20 or 30 years, and some of them as long as 80 years. And they say they still haven't perfected the instrument, so it's pretty hard to learn to play. Well, it's beautiful, yeah. and it was really a great story. Thank you so much. Coming up next, a massive undertaking for its time. The oldest standing building in Idaho is full of history. That story next on Exploring Idaho. The oldest remaining building in Idaho stands on a hillside surrounded by history. The Cataldo Mission was built in 1850, completely by hand. Of course, there were no power tools, and the builders didn't even use a single nail. The mission was built by the Coeur d'Alene Indians as a monument to their newfound Christian faith. And today, a celebration remembers the men and women who labored for their religion. <laughs> It's not that long ago. Uh, it's not that long ago that, that this country was a wild country. All this area in here, this is where our people, you know, our people roam these hills. And just being being here, you can feel the, the spirits where people are still here. In the mountains of North Idaho, it's a day to remember. Like ancestors before them, members of the Coeur d'Alene tribe drum and dance a celebration. Modern-day warriors, the tribe's elders, and the youngest generation are all here to mark the coming of the Catholics. They had this ancient medicine man chief in the 1700s who had a vision, and his power was a raven who could circle and tell him about coming events. Circling Raven looked to the sky and saw the coming of a man in a black robe, a man with a new medicine power, a new religion. 
Father Peter de Smet fulfilled that vision almost 150 years later. His arrival in the West elated the Coeur d'Alene's. The entire tribe converted to Christianity. In 1843, Desmet was joined by Father Joseph Rivali, and by the year 1850, the missionaries and the Indians completed a massive monument to their faith. It was very labor intensive. Jim Boyle is a park interpreter at the Cataldo Mission. He says the entire building was constructed by hand. No nails, no spikes. The timbers that support the structure were cut from whole trees. The Coeur d'Alene's cut them with a handheld axe. It was used with a chopping stroke, like this. And every time you chop, you would knock out a piece. It took months of chopping to finish the two foot by two foot beams. They were joined together with wooden pegs to form a skeleton for the building. Most of them probably had never even seen a log cabin and they had not seen buildings. And all of a sudden they were involved in the building of this huge structure back in 1850. It must have been really an awesome experience for them to be part Father of. Father Thomas Connolly says the Coeur d'Alene's labored with passion for their new God. Families worked together, building the walls with willow branches, grasses, and mud. 145 years ago, these were the actual fingerprints made by an individual that was working here left them for us to see and know that they were here. Father Rivali carved the altars and painted them to look like marble. He also carved statues of the Mother Mary and painted pictures of Jesus. Slowly, the rough outline of a building became a church. Today, a special Catholic Mass gives thanks for the Coeur d'Alene's who found the strength to complete the mission. This was a symbol of the faith and dedication of a small tribal people who had resisted every other change. This is sacred ground here for the Coeur d'Alene's has been since time immemorial, these grounds right here. After the Mass, Coeur d'Alene leader Cliff Sijon walks with his family through the mission cemetery. This is part of my family, is the strength of the black robes. But Saijan says the story of the Cataldo mission is also a story of sadness. When a wagon train would come in here, or a bunch of immigrants would come in here starving to death, who fed them was the inner people. We opened our arms up to them, and it turned out to be the same people that kicked us out of here. In 1889, the Coeur d'Alene's were forced to sell this land and the mission they moved to a small reservation to the south. Today they come back to drum and dance on this land that was once theirs. We are here today to share the goodness of this earth and the goodness of our, of our hearts with everyone. Their celebration honors ancestors who roamed these mountains, who lived in teepees under the trees, and who met their new religion with enthusiasm and strength. You ask me what significance this hill has. It has a lot for us to come back to. It gives us a sense of this is still ours. It really is something you should see for yourself. And fortunately, public tours of the Cataldo Mission are available. And now for an Idaho puzzler. Early fur trappers gave the Coeur d'Alene Indians their name, but do you know what Coeur d'Alene means or why they were given that name? We'll have the answer for you when Exploring Idaho returns. Could you answer our puzzler on what Coeur d'Alene means or why the Coeur d'Alene Indians were given that name? Coeur d'Alene means the heart of the all. Early fur trappers gave the tribe that name because they were shrewd bargainers as tough as the point of a leather worker's awl. If you'd like more information on the Coeur d'Alene's and their work to build the Cataldo Mission, or any other story you've seen on today's show, call for a copy of the Exploring Idaho Field Notes. The phone number is 1-800-443-2461. Be sure to ask for show number 128. 
Here's an extra bit of trivia for you. Before the fur trappers gave them their name, the Coeur d'Alene Indians called themselves the Discovery People. At the Cataldo Mission celebration, they discovered many friends from around the world. We leave you today with a look at the Coeur d'Alene Friendship Dance, and we'll see you next time on Exploring Idaho. Where are you from? Paris. Paris, France. Iran. Iran. Shikoku, Japan. Chicago, Japan. Shikoku. Oh. It's not Chicago, Japan. <laughs> it's a friendship dance, and we're going to move to our left. To our left? This way? This way. Coins. in a unique VHS cassette that really shows off our great state, you're in luck. Exploring Idaho selected some of their favorite stories and put together a video tour of Idaho that has a little something for everyone. If you are interested in purchasing this special one-hour VHS cassette, call our toll-free number, 1-800-443-2461, for the best of Exploring Idaho.